I'm recording. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so if you're just joining us, Juliet Madero just uh, talked about women in science and introduced everybody in the that's in currently in the club, um, gave us a little wave, and then we have a, quite a few other people joining us. So today our speaker um, is Ebony McClellan, and she is a pharmacist. And we, um, she went to Highland um, in 2011, or she graduated in 2011. She's a 2003 Freeport graduate and in Freeport and at Highland, um, she was very involved with a lot of um, activities, which she'll talk about as she goes through. And then we just reached out, you know, we'd like to reach out to former HCC grads and kind of try to gain their experience so that, you know, she can kind of share her experiences with you and hopefully, um, inspire some of you, whether you want to go into pharmacy or just, you know, to achieve your goals. So I am going to share my screen and um, our Ebony first, why don't you want to say hi quickly so that you show up there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And I'm very excited and honored to chat with you about my my career and the education pathway that I've chosen to take um, since uh, attending Highland. And yeah, I'm really excited to, um, to share with you today. Okay, thank you. And we, yeah, it's been fun for us to catch up too. So we thank you for um, being, you know, volunteering to do this and we'll start from here. So whenever you're ready, and if I fall asleep at the wheel, just tell me to advance the next slide. And I certainly First, will. Can we make sure everyone can see the slides? Okay. Okay. So I'll just start briefly with my education background. As Carla mentioned, um, I do have a doctor in pharmacy degree, and I received that from Roosevelt University. School of Pharmacy in 2018 in Schaumburg, Illinois. I received my Associates of Applied Science with a focus in pre-pharmacy at Highland Community College in 2011. And I currently now have about 10 years in retail pharmacy um, from mostly from Walgreens Pharmacy. And I've also worked at Chapco Pharmacy as well. And I have about one and a half years of experience in industry pharmacy and pharmacy distribution. So I heard that there may be some students from AVID or students who just graduated high school. So I kind of want to speak to those students right now just to give them a few words of encouragement and let them know that if you, if you graduated high school and you're not quite sure what you want to do, or maybe even if you're, if you're in college right now, you're in your first year or your second year, and you're not quite sure what path you want to take, that's okay. I am confident that Highland definitely has a course or a program for you. And I just want to share a little bit of my story to help encourage you with that. So when I graduated high school, I thought I was confident that I wanted to be a pulmonologist. And so I set off to University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and I majored in pre-med. I had a tuition scholarship. And when I got there, it was a super huge campus. And I had probably about maybe 300, 400 people uh, per class, big lecture halls. And most of my classes were taught by TAs, teacher's assistants. And it was a big change for me. So some of the obstacles that I kind of had were, um, I was really confused with who do I ask for help? Um, I was conflicted because I was a really smart person and I got really good grades in high school 
And I was confused about why I was struggling. And so I didn't activate my support system. I didn't, I didn't call home. I didn't, um, I didn't ask the professors or the TAs for help because I felt lost in the crowd because there were so many other students and I kind of struggled in silence. So this is a picture of me when I graduated in 2003. And this is a picture of one of the AVID tutors. So I was in a program called AVID and that program helps you prepare for college. So I went away to school with all of the necessities. Uh, AVID taught me how to take notes. It taught me how to study. It taught me a lot of the basic essentials that I needed. Um, the, the issue is just that I really felt lost in such a, such a huge campus. And not to discredit a big university, uh, it just wasn't for me at that time right after high school. So after my years at U of I, I realized I, it was time to come home and kind of revamp what I wanted to do with my life. And I chose to come back to Highland. And honestly, that is where I got my roots. Highland will always be home to me. It definitely helped jumpstart my career in a major way. At Highland, I developed many invaluable connections and it helped because Highland is a smaller size campus. And so I felt more comfortable reaching out to people and talking to professors and to my teachers. And I learned that life is a lot about networking because networking opens up opportunities for jobs. It opens up opportunities for study groups and it really helps you to advance yourself in life. It also helped me to step outside my comfort zone. I wasn't able to do that at U of I because I felt, as I mentioned before, that I was kind of lost in the crowd. But when I got to Highland, and I was in smaller groups. I was able to make friends in classes. I was able to reach out to those friends and I was able to grasp the material better. I was able to ask questions that I needed to ask and I didn't feel embarrassed or, um, or like, I, like I was asking a stupid question. And Actually, two of the people that I was able to connect with were speakers for your Women in Science Club, uh, Haley, who is a veterinarian, and Brittany, who is a doctor now. So it's kind of, it's kind of really cool because um, those were connections that it's really neat to know that I made those connections years ago and to, just to see where they are now where those people are now. So these are some of the organizations that I joined in Highland. Uh, I was in Project Succeed. And in this group, I mentored and tutored students. I was able to attend college conferences. This, and I also received strategies for success. And I was able to build a stronger support system. So the benefits of this is that it helped me to remember course information from past subjects, because even though I may not have been in that particular course, I was constantly reviewing the information. Also, again, I was networking. I was meeting people. I was able to make those lifelong connections. And I'm still friends with some of the people that I tutored or mentored today that, and that was years ago in 2000, 
2011. It also helped me to build and increase my skill set for college and for my career. Because in college and in your career, you'll have to be able to work in a team setting. You'll have to be able to communicate and to explain information to your teammates, sometimes to your superiors. And in, um, and in, a, in a valuable manner to get your point across. I was in the honors program and um, in the honors program, I researched a topic of interest and I completed a project. And this taught me how to, um, it taught me deeper thinking, problem solving skills. Um, and this was really valuable because when I got to college, a lot of the homework that we got um, was based on that deeper level of thinking and problem solving and figuring things out by thinking outside of the box. And also at the bottom are some other organizations I was in. I was in National Physics Honor Society. I was in Phi Theta Kappa and I was on the board of Student Senate. Just briefly, this was my honors program project. Juliet was the honors program director and I did my project in microbiology because that was my favorite class at the time and it still is. Um, the instructor was Carla and I swabbed the nares, the noses of some teachers and advisors at Highland to see if they were carriers of Staph aureus. And after I did that, after I swapped their noses, I um, put it on a, sorry, I lost my place. Um, I put it on the plate pictured and I incubated it for 24 to 48 hours and analyzed it to see who, who out of those people were carriers. And I do remember some of the teachers that were good sports and let me swab them. Um, I believe I did Anthony Sago, I did Mr. Mahina and um, Mr. Sullivan. So they were really nice and let me do them. And this was one of, this was one of my favorite projects that I did, I'll always remember it. Going into some of the benefits of Highland, as I mentioned before, those lifelong connections, the reason that they became so important to me throughout my, my education career and my career itself as a pharmacist is because oftentimes I've needed letters of recommendation, whether it be for a job or an internship um, I've often reached out to my past advisors or teachers to help obtain those letters and also just continued opportunities to network. Um, sometimes my advisors from Highland or people that I've met at Highland, they've reached out to me and have you know, they have opportunities for me to participate in. And that's why it's so important to just always continue to build those strong connections in life. Another reason that Highland will always be, um, will always be the foundation for my career is because I started there and all of my classes transferred just so easily. I originally transferred to a bigger university, actually. I transferred to University of Wisconsin because my plan was to do research. And um, every single class transferred. I had no issues with anything. 
And I remember that my advisor worked very closely with the advisor at UW and it was, I was amazed. I was initially, I was very hesitant, um, but after the first couple of months, it was, it was really great. And I remember when I got to UW and the advisor at UW, he actually knew my name out of all the students that were there. He knew my name because my advisor had been emailing him constantly from Highland. And it was, it was just a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, and it, it turned out perfect. And I will tell you, economically, going to Highland will save you a ton of money because student loan debt is real. And universities can be very expensive. So if you want to save money, it's going to a community college is one way to save a lot of money. Also, if you're not sure what you want to major in, or maybe you're hesitant about what to major in, then I would also strongly suggest going to a community college as well. Even if you want to brush up on some skills, like maybe computer skills, or maybe a foreign language or science, anything like that, I would recommend taking the class at Highland. There's been times where I've been away at school and I've taken a statistics class at Highland or econ uh, economics at Highland just because it's cheaper and I know that it'll transfer to the school that I'm attending and it'll save me a lot of money. All right, so why pharmacy? The reason that I chose pharmacy is because I was highly influenced by my grandma and my grandpa. They had a lot of um, comorbid diseases, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. They suffered from a lot of those and they were on a lot of medications. And so I would help take care of them. And my aunts would always say, never take a medication and you don't know what it's used for. And so I would always get into the habit of telling my grandparents what they're taking and what it's used for. Um, and then also I just became really interested in the medications and how they're affecting their, my grandparents' quality of health. How could I improve their quality of health? And my mission kind of became to increase my knowledge, not only to, mainly to help my family, but also to help others who are underserved, under or uninsured and help those people as well increase their quality of healthcare. So here's how it started. I went to Highland and I met with Mr. TJ Jackson. He used to be an advisor at Highland and he introduced me to a job shadowing opportunity at Shopco Pharmacy with a friend of his that he knew. And from there, I, I asked a lot of questions. He kind of prepped me for it. And he, he told me, um, he told me to, to kind of be open about the situation and ask questions and keep an open mind about it. And so 
that's exactly what I did. I went there, I gave him my all, I wrote a list of questions. And at the end of the day, the pharmacist offered me, told me to apply and I, that led to a job. And ever since then, I've been in love with pharmacy. I, I love helping people. I love discussing um, disease states and I've stuck with it ever since. My advisor was Mr. Anthony Sago. And as I mentioned before, he's the one who worked really closely with my school to ensure that all of my classes transferred. And he worked really closely with my advisor at UW to help me get into the pharmacy program there with ease. So I'm very appreciative to both of those men and um, everything that they did to help me um, kind of get into the role of pharmacy. So here's just a brief synopsis on the pharmacy school path. I took the two years of prereqs path. Um, a lot of people do the four-year bachelor's degree as well. Um, you can do either. So the classes that you need before applying to pharmacy school are your basic science classes, so microbiology, chem one and two, organic chemistry one and two. I had Mr. Sullivan for chemistry and I will tell you, Haley, Haley and I had him and he was the best chemistry teacher ever. So I really enjoyed my time, my chemistry, the time that I took chemistry when I was at Highland. Um, and I've heard horror stories of people who have taken chemistry at really large campuses. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the chemistry classes that I've had at Highland and biology. Um, only calculus one is required, but I took calculus one and two because calculus one was so much fun with Mr. Mahina that I took calculus two. Uh, I also took zoology, but zoology can be substituted in some cases, depending on what school you go to. You just have to look at the prereqs that they require. Um, and you can, yeah, some schools will let you take a different type of science. And then anatomy and physiology. And then once you get to pharmacy school, that's when your actual core work starts. So you'll take pharmacotherapy, and this is a class about how drugs work and affect the body. You'll take, you'll take several semesters of pharmacotherapy. You'll take medicinal chemistry, and this is chemistry based on the actual drugs itself. You'll take biochemistry and pharmacology, which is the action of drugs. So for example, you'll learn all drugs that end in pril are for blood pressure. So lisinopril, which some of you may have heard of, it's a pretty popular, popular drug, or statin. Um, all drugs that end in statin are for cholesterol. And then you'll also do rotations. So rotations are where you, they're hands-on experience in different healthcare settings. And you'll usually start this year, second semester of pharmacy school. So first year, and you'll do it all four years of pharmacy school. And you'll have rotations in different settings. So it can be a clinic setting, it can be in an emergency room, it can be um, in a retail setting, it can be at 
a VA clinic and I had, and the reason that you have your rotations in all of these different settings is because pharmacists can work in a variety of settings. So it's meant to prepare you to work wherever you choose to have your career path. So this is a picture. These are pictures of me during pharmacy school. Um, so the first picture is with the green wall. That's a picture of me at a rotation at Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. And there I had three rotations. So the first one was transitions of care. That's a rotation where I counseled patients who were, who were leaving um, the hospital. So their care was finished and they were receiving prescriptions to be discharged from the hospital. So I would get their medical record and I would look over all of their medications to make sure that there were no drug, drug interactions, to make sure that all of their doses were correct for all of their disease states. I would, if they were getting any new medications like inhalers or um, maybe tobacco cessation, anything like that, I would counsel the patients on how to, how to use any medical devices or any, on any potential side effects um, or on tobacco cessation if they were there for maybe an exacerbation on smoke for smoking or COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Um, I would go and talk to the patients in their rooms before they were discharged home. Here, the second picture with um, me and the two ladies is a picture of Kappa Psi. So Kappa Psi is a pharmaceutical fraternity. I've spoke a lot about networking. Um, all of the people in Kappa Psi are all pharmacists or pharmacy students. And for me, I joined Kappa Psi in pharmacy school because I wanted that strong support system. And I have made a lot of connections through Kappa Psi. Um, and it's helped me with classes. It's helped me reach out to, we also do other activities in the community. Like we've helped with Ronald McDonald House. Um, so when um, parents come in to bring their children in to be treated for cancer, we um, prepare meals for them or do things to help them. We raise money for cancer awareness research. Um, we do a lot of things in the community. We also hold study groups. And so it's, it's a huge support network for me. This is a picture from Compounding Lab. So another thing that pharmacists can do is they can compound medications. So an instance where a medication might be compounded is if you need a prescription that is not available over the counter and it requires two different medications. So what we would do as a pharmacist is we would create a recipe. So we would um, mix the ingredients needed to create a specific prescription. Um, and if it's sterile, like if we're creating an IV or we're injecting something that needs to be done under the hood in a laboratory, this is how we have to dress with um, a bonnet and um, sterile sterile gear.
So what does a pharmacist do? There's a lot of people who are unsure what duties a pharmacist actually does. I know people see pharmacists at Walgreens and they think that sometimes pharmacists just throw pills in a bottle or they kind of just type things on a computer. But when pharmacists are on a computer at a Walgreens or a CVS, they're actually doing a lot of these things. So they're interpreting drug-drug interactions. So maybe your doctor called in a prescription for amoxicillin, but you have an allergy to penicillin. And so amoxicillin is in the same class as penicillin. So that is a drug-drug interaction. And so then the pharmacist would call the doctor and discuss an alternative medication so that you don't have an, have a drug reaction. Um, they also counsel patients on prescriptions. As I mentioned before, one of my rotations was in transitions of care. And so that was a big part of my job on the rotation was to counsel patients on how to use their prescriptions. And there is a law in Illinois now that pharmacists must counsel all of the patients, all patients on new prescriptions to make sure that they're using them correctly. We also make recommendations to doctors. So sometimes doctors may consult us because they have a question on what medication is best for a patient or they want our opinion on what dose to use. We administer vaccines. Maybe you've been to the pharmacy and you've gotten your flu shot or your pneumococcal vaccine. So pharmacists also do that. We manage chronic diseases. Uh, tobacco cessation, I've mentioned that before. Medication therapy management. So this is important too because sometimes patients take a lot of medications and sometimes there's um, a duplication or an overlap and maybe some of those medications can be eliminated or maybe a disease state isn't being covered. And pharmacists are able to look at what patients are taking and determine that and help manage that. Uh, we can interpret lab readings, which is a lot of what I do now. And we also can help with over-the-counter counseling. So. When I worked at Walgreens, a lot of patients would come because they have a cold and they wanna know what to take. Maybe they have high blood pressure and they want to know if they can take Sudafed and, or they're a nursing mother and they want to know what can they take to not harm their baby. And so pharmacists are the first line of healthcare providers because you don't have to make an appointment to walk up to a pharmacy counter to ask a pharmacist a question. So these are all the different types of careers that pharmacists can have. They can teach in academics, they can be the type of pharmacists that a lot of people are familiar with. So they can work in a hospital or a retail setting. Um, they can have a government job. So they can work with the DEA um, with controlled substances. Um, they can do research, which is what I wanted to do at a point in time. They can work with pharmacovigilance which I just wanna point this out in case someone doesn't know exactly what this is. So they can um, prevent different diseases from occurring and spreading or help control 
certain diseases. Um, so right now I am in pharmacy industry and I work in the quality assurance area. You can also, you can also have like a bachelor, a, a bachelor of pharmacy, which up until maybe 10, 15 years ago, you only needed a bachelor of pharmacy to be a pharmacist, but now it's a doctorate degree. And some people even get a master of pharmacy. And with that, I believe, I believe you can do, you can do um, some communication like managing editor and scientific corresponder. And then most people who research, who do research have a PhD. Okay, so I mentioned that I work at Walgreens and I just want to give you a brief comparison of how my day is different versus where I work now at Precision Dose. So Walgreens is considered a retail pharmacy and that means that the drugs are, they come already to dispense. So we just have to count the pills out and put them in a bottle versus at precision dose, the product comes to us and it undergoes one to two years of additional stability testing because it comes in bulk. Um, at Walgreens, the prescriptions come for patients. So the patients can be people or it can be animals. So we got prescriptions for dogs, cat, dogs and cats, uh, and they can come via fax, electronically through the computer, on the phone, or patients can bring in a hard copy. The staff interaction at Walgreens was more varied. It could be with doctors, nurses, um, other healthcare providers, and it was definitely more of a fast paced environment because you're constantly, um, you're constantly filling prescriptions, you're constantly checking for drug interactions or speaking with a doctor at Precision Dose. It, it's more of an office setting and um, as I mentioned, we do stability testing um, to extend expiry dating because we repackage for pharmacy and patient use into unit dose cups and pre-filled syringes. And then once it's repackaged, the bulk product um, goes out to hospitals and retail pharmacies. So now I kind of work on the other end of the spectrum. Um, in the staff interaction, I work mainly with the labs and directors my other and my other colleagues. And it's more independent work in an office setting, as I mentioned. So when I look at drug stability, I'm monitoring the chemical and the micro properties of each drug over a period of time. So the period of time that I'm looking at is usually 20 months to 24 months. And each, each chemical and micro property has a specification. So I'll give you an example in just a second. Um, and it, that depends on if it's a solid versus a solution. So some of the solids that we look at are like diphenhydramine tablets. Uh, some of the solutions that we look at are um, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, valproic acid. 
And we also look at it based on if it's dye free or if it has dye in the product because that affects the stability as well. So we take the product and we put it under different conditions, controlled room temperature and accelerated testing. So we test it under 30, 60 and 90 day testing. And then we do freeze thaw testing. And freeze thaw testing is where we freeze it and then we let it thaw out. And this lets us look at different properties of the drug. And we actually found out that ibuprofen liquid, the uh, suspension cannot be frozen. Um, we figure that out by just going through these different protocols. So the chemical properties that I look at are ID, identification, um, the appearance, color, odor, pH, the degradation products. So we have a mouthwash called, um, it's an antiseptic mouthwash, it's called chlorhexidine, and it breaks down into a lot of different degradation products. Um, some of those can be active and that affects how the drug works and some are inactive. So we look at both active and inactive. We look at uniformity of dosage. So that, it, that is if you pour a medication in a cup and you drink the medication out the cup, how much is left in the cup? So is the patient getting the proper amount out of the cup? Um, and that has a lot to do with viscosity as well. And then as far as micro, the main organisms that we look at are E. coli, salmonella. We don't want any of that in the product. We look at total plate count in yeast and mold. And when I mentioned specification, uh, the in parentheses, that's the specification that we want for those two. We want it to be less than 100 and we want it to be less than 10 for yeast and mold. And so the lab will actually send back, once, it, once the lab tests it, it'll send back a specific specification. It'll say like maybe 0 0.1 colony forming units per mill, or it'll say absent. Okay, I was asked to give you guys advice for the future. And if I could tell you guys anything, I would say, Activate your support system. So friends, family, advisors, whoever that is or may be in your life, make sure that you are not afraid to reach out to them. Um, everybody, Everybody struggles, everybody has questions, everybody needs help and that's okay. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in your class or maybe, maybe you've struggled a lot in the past, you can do it. You just have to you just have to reach out and work hard and you can definitely do it. Um, it's all about the environment that you put yourself in. And that's why it's good to stay active in organizations and stay focused um, because it's good to be around people who have 
the same mindset and perspective as you because they'll motivate you and they'll help you and they'll push you to accomplish your goals as well. Um, also, if you're thinking of going into pharmacy, one thing I will tell you is that it is very important to study every day. Um, in graduate school, time is money. It's expensive. And so you don't want to have to repeat a class if you don't have to. Um, review the material every day, even if it's just a little bit. I, I use flashcards and I hate paper. I hate like printing paper and just having like bunches of paper everywhere. So I used online flashcards. Uh, I put them on my phone and just if I was bored or not doing anything, I would just like flip through the flashcards on my phone and even making the flashcards helps. Um, don't wait till the last minute. Don't procrastinate because it will catch up to you and it, your work will catch up to you very quick. And so it's, this is just, just remember that this is just a small chunk of your life and just focus and do your best, get through this time and then you'll have the rest of your time to, you know, make what you want to out of your life. But for this time that you're in college, try to try to stay focused, try to study every day, review the material and keep your mind focused and network and join organizations to help support you. All right, thank you for your time. Do you guys have any questions for me? All right, so oh, my video doesn't work. <laughs> um, so you can either show me that you, I'm gonna try to make it to a grid. I think I can stop spotlighting. Um, so you can either press a uh, wave or type your question into the chat and um, that way you can, Actually, also, we can somehow give her a round of applause. <laughs> um, I don't know how else other than to either to show and then certainly write your comments because I think we can print these comments for her uh, to show how what you learned and what you enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to figure out how to unmute when you have a question and otherwise put it in the chat because I'm really nervous to unmute everyone because I think I might get loud. As long as you don't talk, maybe it's okay. So let me figure this out. I'm behind the scenes. All right, you should be able to unmute yourself when you're ready for a question. Otherwise, um, before you leave too, thank you for coming. Um, we learned a lot, uh, so I'll let you have any questions too if you want to say anything. Or say hi to Ebony. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, like I'll, okay. yeah, I'll chime in. Ebony, I, I don't know if you remember me or not. It's been about 10 years. Uh, but I loved Ebony talking about building a network while on campus. Uh, she and I actually graduated together in 2011. Uh, so it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, uh, future endeavors. Where are you really thinking right now you're in a good spot and, and where might you hope to go? Uh, are, are you thinking you stay in the Rockford area in, in Northern Illinois? Are you open to go uh, beyond and, and elsewhere? Or, or what is maybe your vision for the future? Dan, how are you? So good to see you. Of course, I remember you. Um, my future endeavors. Good question. Let's see. You know, eventually, I would love to open a clinic and I want to be a provider for primary care. So I would like to see patients and counsel them on just um, primary disease states that affect people. So like 
uh, blood pressure, um, cholesterol, and just, just like those disease states that are really, I feel like if we got a handle on them um, to start with, it would really help um, prevent a lot of things that they build up to like stroke, um, aneurysms, um, heart attack. And I feel like it happens a lot in underserved communities that don't have access to care. Um, and I feel like sometimes the trust and the rapport isn't in those communities. So I'm hoping to kind of find a niche where I'm able to reestablish that, that trust between um, with a healthcare provider and in those communities to maybe lower the rate of those primary disease states. Awesome, that sounds very cool, thank you. We have another question from, uh, oh, there goes my audio. Maybe I can't do both at the same time. Um, Emily is asking, what influenced you to switch from Walgreens to Precision Dose? What made me switch from Walgreens to Precision Dose? Yes. So that's a very good question. Um, I worked for Walgreens for a really long time and I wanted to be in a different setting and I felt like it was time to learn something new. So I decided to switch my, switch my career path and now I'm learning something new that is completely different um, than anything I've experienced um, besides uh, what I've learned in pharmacy school. So it's, yeah, it's definitely a new journey for me. So I'm excited. I like to step outside my comfort zone, um, like I mentioned, and yeah, it's been an awesome experience so far, building new connections and learning about, uh, in, in pharmacy school, they teach you so much, but when you, when you get a career in one thing, it's like you only practice that particular thing. So at Walgreens, I was counseling patients and I was doing drug interactions, but I wasn't really using my science and my chemistry and my micro side. So now I'm getting to apply that. Okay, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or just simply say a comment, but um, we have time for a few more or in the chat. Hi, Ebony. Hi, Mr. Sullivan. How are oh, you? That's great to see you. Uh, great talk, too. Really interesting. Now, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I can be a little bit stingy. Uh, and I was wondering what happens to these drugs that you put through stability testing that go bad. I mean, it seems like, so say half goes bad. That means half is still good. Uh, can't we just double the dose? Hmm. Okay, so double the dose. So you're saying if I have a sample and half of it does not meet the stability specification, can I just double the dose? <laughs> uh, no, because You know, it, it would save a lot of money and a lot of waste, but unfortunately we can't because it the whole the whole product has to has to meet stability specifications. 
And so when one, when a sample doesn't meet stability specifications, then we have to do an investigation. We have to find out, we have to do more testing to see why it didn't meet stability specifications. And then we have to write a formal report and contact the FDA and then it, it's like a long process. So unfortunately we can't. <laughs> I figured it wasn't a real good idea, but it just <laughs> occurred to me. <laughs> Thanks. Good question. Hi, Ebony, Connie Taylor here. So Mrs. Hello, Taylor. Mrs. Taylor, how are you? I am great, and you? Good, so good to see you. Thank you. It's just good to hear what happens to the AVID students after they leave FHS and go on to college and in your case, go on to uh, graduate school. So um, one of the comments that, that struck me was when you talked about the benefit for mentoring and tutoring, it kept you sharp in your skills, something you may have taken you know, years ago, but now you have to brush up in that, uh, in that subject in order to tutor. Uh, and then also to mentor students to uh, be on a successful path. Question I have is do you, um, when you're counseling uh, and maybe not so much in the, uh, the uh, retail, but have you ever thought about non-traditional uh, type of healthcare or do you strictly work with the, uh, the drug Oh, thanks. Is that what you focused on in, in pharmacology school? They do teach us. Uh, we are exposed to some types of non-traditional healthcare, and I have considered that actually. Um, I love healthcare in general, mm -hmm. and I am open to all different types of healthcare. I just love educating people about it. I love when, if someone has a question, um, sometimes I, not everybody learns the traditional way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I even, when I'm counseling someone or answering a question, sometimes I don't explain it to them in a traditional way. Sometimes I'll say, oh, well, if you have an apple and, you know, I'll mm -hmm. tell it as a story or right, in right. a way that can relate to them, especially if I'm talking to a child or, you know, maybe someone who just needs that different way of explaining things. Okay. Just curious. So. Good to see you doing so well. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. So best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Well, it's two o'clock and it's really up to Ebony's schedule, but, and I know some of you might have class to get to or meetings. Um, so up to Ebony, if she has more time for questions, because there are a few more in the chat, we can go a little bit longer, but otherwise, again, thank you for coming and feel free to share more comments as you leave just so she can hear how, uh, what you might've learned or any other additional questions. Um, but Ebony, if you have more time, um, I can ask the chat one. Um, someone just asked, uh, do you, uh, you touched upon your personal obstacles at U of I, but did you have any other obstacles getting into pharmacy school or specific classes? Um, any obstacles getting into classes? Pharmacy, yeah, pharmacy school or specific classes and the person's still here if they want to expand that question. But I, I think just in general and maybe even related to being a woman in science, uh, if there was anything related that way. Yeah, that was my, that was my question. Okay. Kind of touched on what Juliet said is being a woman, did you have any more obstacles getting into those classes or whatever? Okay, so a couple of things I'll touch on um, that I didn't mention. Um, so you do have to take the PCAT and that doesn't really have anything to do with being a woman per se, um, but the PCAT is an important test that you have to take 
um, to in the pharmacy process, but being a woman in science um, and in pharmacy, I will say that you have to be always be confident because there will be people who maybe don't necessarily trust you or respect you as a woman, but know that you are, you are educated and you are intelligent and you are worthy because I have, I have encountered issues and I had a male pharmacist actually pull me aside once and tell me that you're a woman and you are a minority. So you will have to be bold and you will have to be confident um, for those two reasons. Because I've had people come to the pharmacy and I have my white coat on that says pharmacist and they'll say, can I speak to the pharmacist please? <laughs> but, you know, I just always, um, just always be confident in yourself. I'll say, no matter what career you choose as a woman, be bold in your choice and be confident. Do you still have time? Because there's a really good question someone typed in the chat. Yeah. I know. Okay. I didn't know if you have to get back to work. <laughs> oh, no. I took the rest of the day off. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if that person's still here. I can't see their name. Um, they asked in one of their classes, we are currently discussing cultural awareness. Have you encountered anyone that did not want their prescriptions due to their culture? They didn't want to receive their prescriptions? That's what it sounds like. And that person, if you wanna clarify it again, it looks like they're nodding their head yes. Maybe their doctor told them to take a medicine, but they it's they don't want it to because of their culture. Yes, I have had patients like that, and so what I do is a lot of times there's a stigmatism against certain medications, and that's when the kind of like the anatomy comes in, and uh, the you can explain explain to them as a healthcare professional, you know, what's going on with them, what's going on with their body, how the medication is going to work. And you can explain to them the benefits and how they'll feel afterwards. And I just kind of, I kind of start by saying, you know, what questions do you have? What are your, what are your concerns? And I always address those first because if you counsel a patient and they have all of these concerns on their on the forefront of their mind, they are not going to listen to anything you have to say because they're just going to think, oh my gosh, this medication is harmful. I don't want it. I don't want to take it. So I always try to put the patient at ease and I always try to do my best to explain um, why they're using it, um, and how long they'll be using it for. Um, and like I said, how it'll be, how it will improve the quality of their life, because that's another important thing for them to know. And if sometimes they will refuse it, even after all of that is said, and as a healthcare professional, what what you can do is where pharmacists aren't just trained to push medications, you can also give them non-traditional suggestions or, um, or, you know, you can give them suggestions that doesn't, that don't, doesn't involve medications. So maybe um, icing or sorry, using an ice pack instead of taking ibuprofen or, 
you know, things similar to that. Okay, right, how about just one more, if there's any? It looks like Shirley is asking. Yeah, based off of that question, what would you do if you're like not a healthcare professional and you don't have the kind of background? How would you be able to articulate that the medication that that person is supposed to take is good for them? Hmm. Good question. Okay, so if you're not a healthcare professional, how would you articulate that the medication they're taking is good for them? Okay. I would try, I would try to emphasize the rapport that you have with the patient. And I would try to, I would try to work as a team with the, with the doctor and the nurse um, of that patient just to let you know, just to let the patient know that you're on their side and you're trying to help them um, and find out what the patient's concerns are. Maybe the patient is afraid because the tablet is too big or because, um, I mean, patients don't want to take medications for all different types of reasons. And so I would say the, the first thing you can do, whether you're a healthcare professional or not, is listen to your patient. Find out what the issue is and then take it from there. Um, once you find out the issue, if it's something that you yourself cannot solve because you're not a healthcare provider, you can always act as a liaison for that patient and contact the doctor or the nurse and relay that to the healthcare provider and find a common ground to help the patient. Okay, so um, we will stop recording. We'll end the formal part, but anyone who wants to stick around just to talk to her, um, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, if Carla wants to say anything, we'll just, we'll just sit and chat, <laughs> um, but we don't wanna to take too much of your time. All right, thank you, Ebony. It was so much fun to hear and it was